All right, Adam, we're finally here. I've been wanting to come to this museum for a few years now. This yeah. is the Shelby American Collection in Boulder, Colorado. They got some really, shut up, Mike. They got some really uh, historical stuff in there. I mean, I, I don't, I, it, it, it seems so small from the outside, but from the inside, oh, you'll never see this collection God. again. And at least, I don't know, $100 million worth of cars in there? Uh, I'd say about that, right? About a hundred mil. Yeah. Not to ask, but and maybe more. Parts, accessories, uh, history, literature. everything. This is uh, Bill Murray. Hey, Bill. How are you? How doing, are you? Adam? Good to meet you. Good. I'm not going to make any uh, hey, Caddyshack you. jokes. You've it's heard good. them all. We'll just uh, move forward and <laughs> hey, talk I, about cars. You can't imagine how many. I could only in my imagine. <laughs> I would have either killed myself or changed my name to William Murray or Bill Edelstein. Either way, uh, this is amazing. How did this get started? Well, it was, I, I've been restoring Cobras and GT40s for about the last 35 years, and I had a couple of friends that, you know, had a couple of the race cars, and, you know, we just kind of all congregated, and we decided we needed a place to keep everything together, so really just bought this building just to, you know, store this stuff. And then uh, Carol had found out that we had, you know, a lot of cars together, so he calls Steve Volk up one night, and he, he basically says, uh, what the hell are you doing with all those race cars? You need to build a museum here. Mm -hmm. So we kind of thought, well, we got our marching orders from Carol, so then we decided, yeah, let's just go ahead and make it a museum. Uh, tell us about this car. Okay, it's a 65 slash 66 GT40 Mark One, and that was 289 powered. It was one of the uh, earlier GT40s that were made, and this car was actually built in 65, and it was raced by Brian Redman at that time, and it was one of his earliest like professional race car drives, you, you might say. But he did really good. It ran at Nurburgring and all your typical, you know, European tracks like Silverstone and stuff like that. So. It's been a pretty nice car all these years, and I've been vintage racing this one for about 10 years. The GT40 is actually designed by Eric Broadley, which uh, right. he later had a fallout with Ford and brought us the Lola T70. Oh yeah, it, exactly. If it wasn't for Eric Broadley, I mean this and tons of other stuff, because he was basically Lola, you know, that's what got it started. But Ford, Ford picked up the thing and they threw a ton of money at it and they, they wanted to win Le Mans was their real reason for doing this car. Now if you crack up uh, the front of this car or the rear of this car, any of the panels of this car, you can get reproduction parts now, it, right? Yeah, there, there's quite a few of the original molds exist, so you can actually get stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had to put a new front clip on this about two years ago, and it's, other than the, it, the quality wasn't quite as good as the originals, and they were a little bit heavier. Sure. Because originally they were hand laid up with with uh, just cloth, mm -hmm. and now they you know they use choppers and you know stuff, so they tend to get it thick. But no, you can you can buy most of this stuff. The Mark IVs were all built in basically in Dearborn. Uh, the, the chassis were actually made by Brunswick. You know, the, <laughs> when they weren't making bowling lanes, they were making chassis. For really. Did not know that. And in Brunswick, also the material; those were the honeycomb chassis, and they mm -hmm. built the helicopters that oh, were in, really? the, in the '60s that were honeycomb. So that's why they had them do it. Wow! Now, unfortunately, the the tub for that is kind of big, and they hadn't anticipated the size of it. And, and when they put that together, it's honeycomb aluminum, and everything's riveted, and they put these sheets of glue between it, mm -hmm. but the glue, they would have to put it in a giant oven called an autoclave, mm -hmm. and heat it up, and that's what set it. So they they took and they put it up on side, and when they heated it, most of the glue ran out, yeah. and they didn't think much about it, but it, we've heard, that, yeah, the floor of the oven was covered with glue, so they took them out and just cleaned them up, and they did it, and unfortunately, when Ken Miles got killed, one of the reasons was because a lot of that glue, and he was he was in the second one produced when he got mm -hmm. killed. But so the, the glue, glue had run out of it, and it just created weak spots in the chassis, especially up in the front, and it weakened from flexing, and the, the front suspension came apart. And, and that's that I'm was at Riverside. Right, that was at Riverside. I mean, there's tons of theories about what happened. Mm -hmm. but we have some of the parts of the front end of the car, and you can see where that stuff had worked until it came just apart. Just separated. Oh yeah. All right, so now we're uh, in front of uh, the car Carroll Shelby campaign in the uh, mid-50s. It's a uh, Ferrari, ironically, and uh, what year is this and uh, what's the displacement? The car was built in uh, probably late 55. It was run through 56, 57, and 58. And it's, uh, it's a little over four liter. It was the biggest 12 cylinder that they had built mm -hmm. at that time, you know, for a V12. He was the most successful 
other than the Aston Martin, you know, that he won Le Mans with, this was probably the car that he did the most in. Four distributors. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah imagine good. setting the timing and the points on that <laughs> sucker. With the huh? Webers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. my God. And that's a huge Weber. I'll tell you, when this thing starts up, you know something is running. It, wow. It, it just really uh, thumps. And, it, uh, it doesn't have your traditional 12-cylinder sound. It, it just sounds big. It's kind of hard to open. Yeah, how do you open this thing? Donnie, get a putty knife so we can reach yeah. in there. Okay, just hold that one and right. get that down. And this, uh, wow, this is probably a ten million dollar yeah, plus it, car. It's at least ten million. Wow. Uh, but it, isn't that this? Wow. I remember back when it was it was artwork. That it was racing. art. Yeah. You know, I mean, that takes such skilled craftsmen to build stuff. Yeah, like that. and again, no, right. no safety cell there. Just no. an aluminum <laughs> tank. <laughs> no. Unbelievably well done. All right, Bill, what do we have here? Okay, this is a 63 Le Mans car. The serial number is CSX 2137. And the Le Mans cars, they built six of them, and they were the first cars that came from AC over in England to Shelby that were going to be race cars. Before that, they just took a street car and they modified it and, you know, they started racing it. So that what they did, they were able to tell them, okay, we want side vents on the side so it'll cool better. Mm -hmm. We want a hood scoop. And, you know, all kinds of little modifications like that. Now, so, the vents and the scoop, was that done at AC Bristol or was that done in, uh, at uh, Venice, California? Uh, no, that, that stuff was all done at AC, the, the scoop and all that. The rear flares were put on it at Shelby mm -hmm. because they told them, we'll do it because we're putting some different wheels on it. And so they wanted, wanted to, to see how get it fit. exactly how they wanted it right. But this car, it, this was the very first Cobra to ever win an FIA race in 1963 with uh, Dan Gurney running it at Bridgehampton back in New York, which was a, a very popular FIA race at the time. What yeah. do you think this car is worth? I, I would say it actually uh, it's 2136, another Le Mans car. It sold for about one and a quarter million at uh, Monaco at the RM auction uh, just a couple of months ago. And that car had been not destroyed, but it had been burnt. It had not one original piece of bodywork on it or anything. I didn't know there was uh, two breathers on each valve cover on these things. Is that something it, that got added well, on? Well, it, it kind of, no, that's the way they did. And that, that changed. Eventually, they just went back to the one on each ones. side. But the reason they, well, two reasons. One was for breathing to, you know, help it keep from building up. The other was so they could add oil quicker. Oh, they I see. Could just, no matter they what just mechanic was the there, they can pop it off and, you know, and get it in there. The now, is thing. this the uh, General Motors radiator that's on nope. it? No, this is it. Early, by early? this point, they had quit doing that. The early ones, they used that Harrison. It was actually the exact one out of the Corvette, but they had, they modified the uh, inlet and outlet, you know, for mm -hmm. the Cobra. And that was used in all the, well, all the early street cars up until maybe about 100, 125 or more built. And they were using on the first race cars until GM found out they were using them and they didn't want them to, so they ordered all their dealers and distributors in California not to sell them to Shelby American. So then they, they had Ford owned McCord and so McCord started making the radiators. Okay, the next one, that's got to be everybody's favorite. That's called an FIA Cobra. They only built five of them. It's the only race Cobra that still sports its original paint and everything in here. These tires, all this stuff is from the last race it ran in 65 in Rossfeld, Germany. Not only is a Survivor, which is so unique these days, it's an but FIA. it's also, it has the best record. It won four FIA races in 64 and 65. And it, I don't know, it didn't have two famous drivers. It was only Bob Bond, Rod, Phil Hill, Sir John wow. Wood, you know. So, and then uh, the last year this thing was campaigned was what 65. 65. And, and, it, um, and it was only raced in Europe in 64 and I'm 65. I'm sure somebody's got a great story about uh, trying to unload this thing in 67 <laughs> and who wouldn't pay three grand for uh, it. Oh, oh yeah. It, it, this car... Uh, Where did it sit? So it must have just been stuck somewhere. No, it, a guy bought it from Shelby, I think, in... Probably, I'm going to say late 60s, probably 66. He, they were trying to sell a lot of race cars, and this was actually one of them. And the guy bought it. He was going to run SCCA with it, and he just never did. And it, it, I think he said he drove it one time, just kind of like around the block, and that was it. And then it sat until uh, a friend of mine, Mike Schoen, whose parents owned a U-Haul company, and he became a very one of the first real famous Cobra collectors. He 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 just he was the first guy to really go. Yeah, I want them all. I want right. every race car and stuff like that. What year so, did he? So pick he, this he bought up? it, I think, in 1972. Oh my God! What did he pay for it? Yeah, uh, I, I think it was about 4,500 bucks or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and brought honestly, it home in a the car. It, it, well, to start with, uh, Steve that owns it now, he would he would never sell it. 
but it, it would have to be in that 15 to 20 million dollar really or something like that. really just because you absolutely cannot duplicate this car now and, and it's not because it's weird anything. or creepy it's because of look what it did and then look at the condition of it yeah yeah that's the firing order that one of the yeah. one of the uh, european mechanics wrote on it in 1965 one five four two six three seven eight. They wow. put that on there. Just, it's still there. But we we have a picture of this car where you can just barely see that with the hood open in 1965. But still, things like that that verify all the authenticity. Oh yeah, th this car it, it, it's just the neatest. And and in '64, the color right now is guardsman blue. Yeah, kind of like, like a, a variation. The silver uh, mm -hmm. blue. Right. It, this was the Viking blue. That was actually the team colors in '64. Mm -hmm. And you can see when they repainted it in '65, actually over in Europe. John Wire ordered it to be painted because they had already changed the guards in blue in the States. Yeah, they didn't even mask off the so wait, what did John Wire order the color change? Yeah, John Wire, was, he was in charge of the European racing for Carroll. What, yeah, he was in charge of the F5. Right, and, I mean, Ford, Ford actually vehicles. Ford said, we want, this is how the story on Guardsman in Blue goes. Uh, Ford, somebody at Ford said, we want the colors to look more like our emblem. Yeah, which mm -hmm. is a dark blue. Right. And so uh, they really hadn't decided on anything. And uh, uh, Dan Gerber, he was racing a Cobra that he had bought, and he had it painted uh, garden blue. It was just the color of a, of a station wagon, a Ford station wagon. Mm -hmm. He liked it. And then this car looks like it has an alternator. It's an yep. early it, this, alternator. This was the first one to get the and Good eye. This is the rounded alternator. Back. Wow. It has the That's plug it. in instead of all the bolt in terminals. Wow. On. Could you even find one of those today? You can, but I know where to find them. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's telling it. Anybody. Right, they're, they're, they are tough to find. They, they are very tough, and they had special made pulleys on the front that were bigger, and it was out of a stamp material. And they're really hard to get on and off, so usually people ruin them when they take one right. apart to try rebuild to, it. Try to pull it, yeah. In 1965, they weren't running around the shop going, oh, okay, get the five FIA cars ready. They, they really didn't kind of... A lot of times they might have a word for the car, like uh, from either the driver or because it ran at a race, mm -hmm. like a Riverside. They say, get the Riverside car, you know, right. or something. But anyway, so this, uh, not not this exact car, but this has right here, see these little, it's a little, know, little uh, dimples? They yes. actually were called dimples, and that became known as the FIA dimple. With, uh, in 63, the first FIA race they ran was at Sebring. It was actually it was in this car that's on this picture behind us. They were going through tech inspection, and one, a weird FIA rule. These are rules from back, like, in the 40s and stuff. Sure. You had to have a suitcase had to fit in the trunk. And it was just a wooden mock-up, just a piece tire, of wood. Spare right. suitcase. Had to have the spare tire, the top, the... Everything, jack, the side curtains, you know, windows, stuff like that. So they couldn't, the, the trunk wouldn't close when they put this in. It's just nobody had thought of it at right. that point. And so the Carol and all the big shots, they're all yelling at each other. And oh, so during the inspection, though, the officials right. are like, I'm sorry, the suitcase doesn't fit in the and, trunk. And they have a suitcase that's sort of a uh, template suitcase right. that has it, to it, fit. It's just a template. And so while they're arguing about it, just a, a real low, simple mechanic, he came over and he just slammed it shut. And it bent, dented it, bent but it stayed aluminum. closed. And they said, OK, you can run it. So then they, they did three more the next three when they did the FIA cars, they did three of them like that. Then they wound up kind of modifying the inside of the trunk just ever so slightly with the gas tank where they could get it and in there, were, there a little better. Once again, there were only five FIA right, Only five official. of these FIA cars. And this is the only one that exists in total. And then there's another one that probably half of its original. It was wrecked really bad in 64. Nürburgring killed the driver eventually. But it was it was sent back to AC before it came back to the United States and repaired, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say, oh, that's not that's a horrible piece. And then the other three, well, two of them are total gone, and then there's three or four fakes of each one. It's it's interesting that there's there's original cars and then there's original original cars because some of these guys. It's basically just a frame with a serial code oh, yeah. on it, and every like panel, yeah, every yeah. everything, every other part on the car is essentially new or built or done on an English right. wheel. Right, and, and you know, the vintage race cars, I mean, you got to expect they were torn up. Right. I mean, if they weren't torn up when they were being raced in 1964, they've been torn up in the last 40 years, you know, certainly. Sure. So, so this there, is a there real are unique are varying case. degrees of, of originalness and right. stuff you see. But like, look at this, you can see how kind of just pushed on the body is and stuff. So you know this isn't fake. Right. <laughs> you go through tech inspection and they, they put a template on the window and that's what it looks like. Right. 
he gets about the first lap and he pulls that down like that. Sure. And then when he's coming in, he pushes it back up. Right. Again. But that that was the extent. Right. <laughs> but I, you know, I might have given him an extra couple miles an hour or something like that. And yeah. Who came up with that idea? Do you uh, I don't know exactly who. My bet is it's probably Phil Remington. Ten, he was. Yes. So when like Shelby that. took over the Princeton factory, he took over uh, the Scarab factory, and Phil Remington and the part of the crew was all there. Exactly. Right. No, that was the best thing yeah. Shelby did. That really got him. It, it, what it did, he got the experience, and they had a, a, about four or five New Zealanders who were really good fabricators for some reason back then. And that was uh, kind of the bulk of the guys. Yeah. You know, like John Olson, guys like that were so good at fabricating. You know, everybody probably knows by now that, you know, the Pete Brock design, they made six Daytona coupes. Sure. Those were all raced under the Shelby American Ford banner. So John Wilmot racing, so he wanted to buy one, and Shelby said, look, we, we, we need them. And so Shelby agreed to send all his plans and blueprints over, plus John Olson, who was one of the chief fabricators on the six coupes, to build them one. So he went over in two months' time, they built this, and they, they made some of their own little modifications on it, which they thought were going to make it better, which who knows if it's better or not. But anyway, so it was raced as a John Wilmot uh, uh, Cobra Coupe, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, throughout the And why, why did Shelby help him out that way? Okay, he was a, a. They were already racing Cobras. I wonder what uh, Brock thinks of this car. Have you ever talked to him about yeah, it? Yeah, Pete does like it. I mean, uh, Pete well, loves I, his design, and uh, certainly the you know, traditional Daytona Coupe is better looking. Yeah, I agree. Uh, some of the lines are a little sharp on this and stuff, but Pete understands the history, and this won more races than any other Coupe. Not as prestigious. Oh, not oh as really? Prestigious a race. Of the races, but, but it ran interesting. A, a lot of races throughout the late 60s, you know, after they kind of quit running the, the Cobras. Well, uh, last but not least, the uh, J car. This is the uh, big block GT40, right? Oh, yeah. This is, uh, I guess you'd have to say it's the ultimate in any GT40 that was built. It was obviously the last ones. They called them the Mark IV. I remember when I saw the first pictures of this in, in 66, what they were doing. And I, I was just a kid. I was in high school or something. I thought it looked like a rocket ship, <laughs> you yeah. know, honestly. And it's still, you know, uh, 40 years later or whatever, it still looks like it's from the future. What would this car's uh, top speed be over at Le Mans? In Le Mans, this car went, I, I believe it was 238 miles an hour. Which really? Was, which was a record for a straight line speed on the Mulsanne Strait. And, and that's it, before it, they put the it, chicane in it, the Right, that's one of the reasons why they did the chicane, because cars were getting too fast. But I believe that still stands. I mean, I could wow. be wrong, but I think that still and stands. And on, on the tire technology of the oh. uh, late 60s, early yeah, that, 70s. Yeah, that's hard right? to imagine, yeah. They went from the small block to the big block at this point. No, and uh, they that, didn't. That, that, actually, they had done it the year before in 66. Six. Oh. When Ken Miles won, they they used the Mark One chassis and they put a 427 in it uh, called a Mark Two. Oh, they had the Mark One chassis with the big block in it. Right, right. No, no, it was I never called the Mark that. Two. They, and really, the chassis is the same. They they just had to do different mounts and you know for the engine and stuff. And the Mark Fours really at the end of '66 uh, they were going to start running the two two four barrels. That was mm -hmm. okay in the rules. So they actually did it on the uh, on the Mark Fours. And also, if you ran a Mark Two in '67, you can run the dual, and, dual four. Now, what are you going up against? Like in this car, uh, I mean, you have huge cubic inches. You have you know huge carburation. And who's, I mean, as far as the rules go, what Ferraris are P3, you going up against? The and, but, 3, 330p3 was its stiffest competition. But there are quite a few less cubic inches, I'm oh, guessing, yeah, less cubic car. inches, but they were quite a bit lighter, and mm -hmm. they did handle better. Which you know. Porsches, too, were racing at the time? The uh, 90? Uh, probably the, the 907 or something like that, was, which Porsche wasn't really a big player yet. You know, no, really. Close, yeah, now that came close. in in 1970. Right. You know when they. But it's in it, It's the closest Le Mans race ever. Jackie Ix uh, driving right. 1075. And right. So, uh, but, so but Porsche came in a little later, but the 330 P3. I mean, that was a. That's a. Oh, that's, yeah. that's one of my favorite. Oh, I love that car. Oh, Ferraris of all time. Yeah, yeah. it's beautiful. It's this challenge of how light and how powerful can we make a car, but. Uh, when you want to start adding roll bars and cages and crumple oh, yeah. zones and stuff, you start adding weight, so it's kind of sort of counterintuitive to making a light car. Right, and they put it, the uh, the Mark 1s never had the roll bars in them. The Mark 2s, they did put kind of a semi-roll bar in it, and then the Mark 4s, this actually has a full roll cage that goes all the way down here. Oh, yeah. It was a turning point, that 66, 67 error. That became one of the real focal points. Well, it was like a gentleman's sport 
at that point where everything was handcrafted and just right. rich guys were racing. But then when Ford enters the picture, it turns into this corporate machine where science and technology and, and right. competition they, they certainly really had whatever. They had no budget for this. For the 67, and they, they built... Uh, well, who didn't well, have a budget? Well, see, it was nine of the, of the J cars were built. Mm -hmm. The first two were prototypes. They had that different body. It was called the bread van body. They were yeah. tall rear end. And that's oh, what right, Ken right. got killed yeah. in was one of those. So they, so they actually only had uh, five of them that raced. They only raced in two races in 67. They raced at Daytona, and none of them finished because they had some faulty uh, main shafts in the gearbox. All of them broke. All, mm -hmm. all their spares, everything. So they never finished the race, and they, they ran, uh, or, or they never got to start it because they were breaking so many. Uh, they won Sebring mm -hmm. with, with one of them, with Mary Andretti won it, and then they ran uh, three of them or four of them at Le Mans 67, and that was it. That was the only two races, Sebring and Le Mans 67, that Mark IVs or GT4s or the, the, the J cars ever raced. Fuel tanks on each side yeah. <laughs> of the driver. And no, oh, they're real nice and cozy for you. No they, bladder they, they, or yeah. anything in there. Oh, no, right? these did have bladders. They had bladders. Oh, okay. Uh, you said you might fire this thing up for us? All sure. right, Bill. Okay, it's kind of neat on the Mark IVs. You know, Shelby, the um, aircraft uh, technology kind of overlapped on the Cobras a little bit, and then it kept getting more and more on the GT40s. So all the all the electronic stuff, which back then you wouldn't have called it electronic, it was just wires and everything. Right. And it was all really special made stuff. So. Yeah, they, but it was special made in the sense that they went to the surplus uh, <laughs> junkyards and pulled all this aircraft stuff. Right. right. Well, that's where they that's where they found the stuff. And Neil Carroll, he was in the military, so and he was a pilot, and he he, he was he thrifty too. Oh, he was a little he was thrifty. thrifty. Well, Bill, uh, this has been a treat, Donnie. Is there anything oh, we're we're missing here? I mean, oh, I know we're missing, missing things. We're going to have to come back here again and do a part two. Yeah, um, this is uh, I've been unbelievable. I've tried to get here for many, many years, and this is great. That well, that's good. It worked out. Yeah. Some time. Same time. Yeah. yeah, and uh, Bill, we want to thank you for your time and for firing up the cars. And uh, you know, Donnie uh, fancied himself a little bit of an expert when it comes to uh, Shelby and Maybe Cobra and GT4. <laughs> well, but I just think uh, you you went from your undergrad degree to your doctorate in uh, Shelby in the last two hours well, walking my dad, around there, right? Know, he's, he's a great guy, but he's also a pain in the ass. But one of the greatest things that he did is he he dumped all this automotive stuff and the first cars that I knew about were Corvettes and Cobras from oh, the beginning of great. my life so great yeah, well, you couldn't ask for more oh, Bill and uh, toss out you had a uh, website or something if people want to come check you out yeah, yeah, when the museum is open and everything yeah it's just open on Saturday from uh, 10 to 4 but the website is shelbyamericancollection.org Bill it's been uh, our pleasure thanks for your time alright Adam it was Appreciate good to see you